reach out to me. So I am Katie Percy. If you don't already know me, I have been the Baton Rouge Audubon Society Programs Chair and also moderating the presentations while we have been doing them via Zoom. So thank you all for joining. If you could go ahead and stay muted, which it looks like just about everybody already is. Um, let me continue to admit, admit those that are joining. So you can stay muted. If you wanna use your mic at the end of the presentation, uh, feel free, free to do so since there aren't an overwhelming number of people. Um, in the Zoom meeting. And then you're also welcome throughout the presentation to use the chat function within Zoom if you have questions or comments and you wanna drop them in there. And then as always, I'll just read those out loud to our presenter at the end so everybody can hear the question and the answer. Um, okay, I think that's it. And let me go ahead and slide John Dillon's bio over. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read probably just about everything he sent me because it's all, it's a little, it might be a little lengthy, bear with me, but it's all so interesting. So John Dillon is a native of Claiborne Parish and returned there to live after completing his Master of Arts in Philosophy at LSU in Baton Rouge and then teaching and then also received his teaching certification in 2002. He started learning birds as a kid around 1980 after his mom bought him a copy of the Little Golden Book Field Guide to Birds of North America to draw pictures of birds and he eventually memorized most of the book and illustrations. But he didn't start birding um, until I guess more officially until the early 2000s when he learned about the birding community in Baton Rouge and um, learned much by creeping around the old LA bird in its heyday before eBird. He has taught English, mostly American and British literature at Minden High School in Webster Parish since 2006 and founded the Minden High School Nature Club there in 2007. He and club members travel in and out of the state yearly and were featured in the ABA's Birding Magazine in 2019 for their experiences helping Audubon, Louisiana bi biologists catch and ban black rails and yellow rails. Uh, some of his members began, began their life list with those birds and he lives in rural Claiborne Parish in Athens where he just recorded Bobolink as yard bird number 143. He is also a supporter of native plants his yard is certified at the uh, gold status by the Louisiana Native Plant Society, and he serves on the board of directors for the Briarwood Caroline Dorman Nature Preserve, which we had a presentation about earlier this season, also on the YouTube channel if you want to check that one out. And John has also been on the Louisiana Bird Records Committee for 10 years and is currently the president of the Louisiana Ornithological Society. He is also a regional reviewer for eBird and eBird Hotspot editor for North Louisiana. Um, so a tremendous amount of gratitude for all of this wonderful work that you do for our birding community and paying it forward. Um, more than many and can't thank you enough for joining us this evening and in volunteering your time yet again. Well, thanks Katie for that. Thanks to all of you for having me. Uh, the presentation that I'm gonna do tonight uh, was originally made by Donna Dittman and Steve Cardiff. And I know being BRAS members, you know who they are. Um, and Donna contacted me a few months ago and said she might be out of town, maybe unable to do this. Uh, could I do it? And which is kind of a daunting task because Donna is one of the most amazing and most intelligent individuals I've ever met in my life. So, um, but I, you know, uh, said, okay. And, and um, <clears throat> so we started working the presentation a few months ago, you know, trying to transition over to I could do it. And so I've made quite a few changes because I told her, you know, she just made these notes on, on different uh, slides and I said, I can't do the notes if you, I have to do scripted stuff for, for a presentation or otherwise I'll just go on for like six hours and won't shut up. So uh, with that being said, let me share my screen, pull this up so I don't keep you here all night and you'll all end up hating me. Um, so hit play. 
All right. Everybody see that? Everybody's good? It, it looks good. We can see it. All right. Um, let's see. I'm just going to move my little box here. Okay. So uh, it's this is all about how to document rare birds. And it, there's, there's really a lot to this. Um, I've, uh, I've downsized this presentation quite a bit, took out a few, several slides because when I went through and rehearsed it a few times originally, um, it was quite lengthy. And, and so I'm going to try to keep it a little shorter tonight. So let's go ahead and get started here um, and just talk about what docu documentation really means. All right. Documentation can refer to the process of providing evidence as in to document something as in a verb. Um, and of course, it can also provide, uh, refer to the actual material, the document that's communicable material like text, video, audio, photographs, any combination uh, used to explain some attributes of an object. But the focal point here, whether verb or noun, it should be on pro providing evidence. The whole point is to provide evidence. Documentation, documentation itself is not about the subjective experience. It's not about what happened to me. It's about objective observation, gathering evidence that can be effectively relayed to another person uh, to review. All right, so what makes a bird rare then? Rarity is really a relative term in birding and ornithology, right? It can imply more than one idea and it may apply and not apply even to the same species. So you take this Scarlet Tanner's you're here in this photo, April and May, hey, that bird is really not rare at all in Louisiana. But if you had one in January, that's a big deal. Rare also isn't the same as uncommon. So lots of new birders, uh, you know, they say something like, I saw a bald eagle recently. I say, hey, that's great. That's one of those stewardship birds. But it's not at all rare, really. So just because you haven't seen it before doesn't mean that it's rare. So let's look at three different types of rare, population size, temporal distribution, and spatial distribution. With population size, there's no big surprise here, right? A bird like Kirtland's warbler. We know it has a small population size because of a restricted range and a restricted habitat. It nests in jack pine up around the Great Lakes. Um, so you'd never expect to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of these birds. So they, they'll probably have a pop small population size forever. But if you look at birds that are temporarily rare, um, there are maybe millions of them, of that species, and they're in the right place, but they're there at the wrong time of year. And this typically happens with migrants. So here's an example of a semipalmated sandpiper. And if you look at the bar chart at the bottom, you'll see these big wide bars for spring and fall and little narrow lines outside that. Well, you know, the meaning here is obvious. Um, where those wide bars are with that time, are with that time of the year, not rare at all, but other times it's very important to document that bird. Keep in mind, uh, extra normal graphs like this, that's based on years of data, decades, if not sometimes a century or more of data. So rarity here is not relative when you're talking about this. This is very objective. Um, you can look at the map again, uh, the range map here, you see the blue for winter, the, the orange for, uh, for breeding. And that migration, okay, well, if, if a bird occur, occurs outside that migratory period during the summer or winter, then you know it's off, right? So at that point, it's temporarily rare. Then you get geographically rare, right? What do we normally refer to as vagrants? So like this glaucous gull. Uh, this gull is supposed to be breeding around in the Arctic, right? And then wintering um, Great Lakes area on, on the um, east and west coast of Canada. But... Sometimes they end up down here. And we've had lots of records of this species to go over the years, um, but not really supposed to be here. But they do show a pattern of vagrancy. Some birds do, some birds really strictly do not. This is sort of a, just a wacky list of some of the most unexpected species Louisiana has ever seen. An ancient murrelet, you may not know about that one. That was from 1954, right? <laughs> 1954, ancient murrelet, that's it. Snowy owl, how many of you would drop everything to chase a snowy owl in Louisiana? I'm not much of a chaser. That's one I would, I would really have to go after. Black-tailed godwood, Eurasian species, it'll show up every now and then. Uh, Brown-chested martin, that's a crazy one. Mangrove cuckoo is a really good one found you know, several years ago. 
What would you do if you look at your feeder and you've got a varied bunting out there? Uh, that's just insane. Beautiful bird. And this one that's under name, I believe, is a gray flycatcher found by Terry Davis uh, a few years ago and photographed by Jeff Strahan. So just wide variety here of first state records that are really bizarre. So that's where the LBRC comes in, right? The Louisiana Bird Records Committee. I guess every state has a bird records committee, um, <clears throat> but it is exactly what it sounds like. We review rare bird rec or bur records of rare birds that are submitted to us, right? Established in 1979, uh, I was four then, so I did not help establish, but some people now who are really old <laughs> established the LBRC in 1979. And one thing we do is we keep up the review list. The review list is the, that's the species that we ask you to submit records about. If you see these, um, we really ask for information on the, on the review list species. Sometimes we'll review things that are outside this by special request, but typically it's the review list birds that we're looking for. And we want to determine the validity, validity of the records of rare birds in the state and also uh, out of the Gulf, right? Um, we publish our results every year in the annual newsletter that's made by Donna. It's beautifully done, by the way. Um, and you can check those out on our website and download all the old copies if you want to. Um, all this is also uh, maintained in archive records, also on the website. All the uh, reviewed records and also pending records are there if you look at. And we also keep the state, the, the official state list, right? So, uh, and that, of course, the state list is kind of governed by first state records that we then add to the reviews if they're accepted in the state list. Generally, we contribute to the knowledge of the birds of Louisiana, and we want to establish high standards for record, for record reporting, very high standards. And let me just take a second to add this. An LBRC, we, we have to get things right, 100%, right? We're really not capable, I mean, we, we can't put ourselves in a position to where we open ourselves up to much error. So for example, if we accept the first state record of a bird, and then a few years later realize that that record, there was something wrong with it, we have to withdraw it. Um, you look sort of foolish in that kind of position. And people might question, well, why have an LBRC anyway, if you're gonna make those kind of mistakes? So there's a lot of pressure on committee members to get this right. And we respect that, we respect that. Um, it takes a lot of extra work and a lot of time and a lot of studying to try to get everything right every time and be fair every time. Um, the review list currently has about 150 species. This 153, that may be off. I'm not sure if Donna adjusted that after our last meeting or not, because we could took a couple species off the review list. But um, on a state list of about 485, have about 150 species on there, which require review, that's a lot, right? Um, some may have only been seen once or twice ever. Um, others maybe 40 or 50 times, um, but they're on the review list for a reason. What reason? Well, we define rarity. The LBRC bylaws define rarity as an average of four or fewer records or occurrences per year, four or fewer occurrences per year, averaged over a 10 year period. And I'm stressing that for an obvious reason. That's pretty rare, right? Um, we'll add new species to the state list, uh, to the review list after we accept them to the state list, right? And then of course, like I said, we, we review and revise that review list usually every year, right? Because we may have to pull birds off that list. For example, this broad-tailed hummingbird, right? Broad-tailed hummingbird was removed from the list in 2002 after it went well over that average of four or four year records per year over a 10 year period. Um, I think, why those numbers? Well, consider a few years ago when we had this crazy influx of green tailed towhees. We had something like, I don't know, 40 something records around the state of, of green tailed towhees all in just a matter of a couple of months one winter, right? Have we had any since then? Uh, I don't think so, maybe one or something. So, do we put it on, take it off? No, it, we, you have to look at this longitudinally. Um, just because we have this eruption one year doesn't make it a common bird, right? So there are really three base review categories. You get species that occur a few times annually or almost annually. So a couple examples, 
Elsvario, Blitz Oriole, Spotted Tohi. I think all three of which have now been taken off the list, but I'd have to double check that. I know Bells has. And then you've got species that occur much less frequently, like Ruff, Harris's Hawk, Redneck Phalarope, right? So you might go two or three or four years without getting a Ruff or something. Uh, and then all of a sudden you get two or three in a year. Fine. And then there's first state records, the coveted first state records, right? Like this green breasted mango uh, that was found by a homeowner um, outside Shreveport a few years ago. And I got lucky enough to see that bird. It was only there for a day. That was really cool. Um, so what's the process here? You have your unusual observation. You check the review list to see if it's on there. Hey, it is. So you submit it to the LBRC. And at that point, we review the record sometime after that. Then it's published in our newsletter and also on the website. All those data are housed at the website. So how do we review your records? I'm sort of pulling the curtain back on our process here. So you submit the long form in the media. Thanks, because we can't do anything unless you submit a record, by the way. Paul Conover then uploads those records to the pinning pages. Donna, as LBRC secretary, she selects records and then circulates them to all nine members in an e-round, a big you know, emailed round of the document on it. E-rounds contain about 60 to 110 records to review. There's nothing in the bylaws about how many it should contain, but on average, there's somewhere between 60 and 110. Some new, some previously reviewed because they're unresolved. And if you're thinking 110 records, that's a lot. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Um, we have about a month, three or four weeks or so to review all those and vote on them and return them to everybody else. We also don't collaborate on votes, right? We can consult outside experts if needed. So if you're reviewing, let's say, a first state record uh, Sladyback goal and you want to contact a couple of goal experts, go ahead, you know. Um, but we don't consult with each other, especially in, in first circulation. After that, we can but first circulations, we don't. So that first circulation, acceptance must be unanimous. Again, we want to try to get this right. So acceptance is unanimous. Uh, the record is recirculated unless it's unanimously rejected. So if you have one reject vote, two reject votes, then it's recirculated. If it's unanimously rejected, it goes bye-bye. We never see it again. Second and third circulations, it's accepted if it's unanimous or if it's eight to one. It's rejected if it's five or more rejection votes. Fewer than five rejected, uh, rejection votes on a second round, a third round, it happens again, it goes to a fourth round. And we discuss that record. That's a discussion round, uh, which we do in our annual meeting, which is every March. Um, it's accepted if no more than, it gets no more than one reject vote, right? Uh, so two rejection votes and that fourth round circulation, that, that record is gone, right? To give you an idea of the meetings, uh, 2021 meeting, which is over Zoom, 2020 meeting, we had to cancel because of COVID, 2021 meeting in March, had about 19 discussion records that we'd all voted on three times already, um, and six other agenda items to discuss. The whole meeting took about seven and a half hours over Zoom. So we do take it seriously. Uh, it's a lot of work to do. Now the LBRC page, website. If you go to losbird.org, you'll be able to go to the LBRC page from there. If you've never really nerded out on this page, you should let yourself do that. You're, you're worth it. All right. It's really pretty cool. It's not just for the review list or to find a download a long form. You can find all the current pending records that we haven't voted on yet. And you can find all the records that we have voted on and what happened, whether they were accepted, rejected, that sort of thing. Uh, with the accepted records, we have everything. We have the name of the, the observer and when it happened, all that stuff. With rejected records, just to not make anybody feel uncomfortable, we don't put names with that. But we do put, like, there was this um, bulletorial from 1974 that got rejected because there wasn't enough evidence in Terrebonne Parish. Okay, that might be on there, but there's no name attached to it. Well, speaking of names, I do have to shout out a big thank you to Paul Conover, who is our, LBR, our LBRC webmaster, and now also webmaster for LOS. He uploads all your long forms, all the media, keeps all the records up to date, uh, emails that off to Donna so she can collate everything and send us all the e-rounds. He does a lot of work on that and keeps everything really nice on there. All our old newsletters are on there. You can download those for free. Um, 
the photo and record gallery is where you want to go to look at all the old stuff. And if you're a new burger, or if you're really just coming into your own sort of an up and coming burger, you really owe it to Louisiana Burdick and Conservation to look at that photo and record gallery and just see, get a better idea of how often uh, different rare species have been to the state. There's also a map feature that we've got on there that Eric Johnson contributed to the page a few years ago to show you all the parishes that each rare species uh, has been, they've been found in. So it's very, very, very cool stuff in there. You'll nerd out for a while if you get on there. There's a lot of forms on the website. Um, this is part of it. Donna set this page up all cool with all these little tricks and stuff here. So. <laughs> Um, we ask you a lot of questions. That's why it's called long form, right? Um, and if you look at this, you'll see things like the optical equipment you were using, the distance to the bird, the duration of the observation, the habitat. That's all so important. And a lot of people will skimp on that. Um, <laughs> it, it, it also makes a difference in the observation, right? If I'm driving down the interstate 75 miles an hour and I see a golden eagle about, you know, 300 yards away for about five seconds, man, uh, that's, that's not really, really solid, right? So the circumstances of that, value, of that observation can make a difference, of course. Um, if you look at what's highlighted here for the description, we don't just want to know about the bird with the observation, right? But the description of the bird is hugely important. We, don't, we want to know what you actually saw, what you actually saw. Um, we're asking for things like the, the eye color, the leg color, the size of, apparently, you know, compared to other birds, anything you can put on there to convince us that this is what you saw. And of course, photos, uh, that's hard evidence. Uh, that can make a huge difference too. We'll come to that later, but the description really makes a huge difference. And I wanna point out one more, number 17, similar species include how they were eliminated by your observation. So let's say if you had a first date record cactus rib. Cool, right? You couldn't get a photo. Okay, well, there is a bylaw that says you have to have hard evidence for a first date record to be accepted. But let's ignore, let's say it's a second record, second state record, how about that? And then you don't mention anything about why it wasn't a Buick's rim or why it wasn't a Carolina rim or why it wasn't some kind of funky thrasher or something like that. Um... You're hurting your record, right? This question is on there for a reason. You know that some species are very similar to other species. And the rarer the bird, the more documentation and explanation is required. So let's talk about hard evidence now, not just your written statement, right? Hard evidence being photographs, videos, audio recordings, which can be really great sometimes, and of course, specimens. Now, I'm not suggesting you out and get a specimen, but should it happen or you have a license, okay, you know. But here's a first date record, uh, Yeberu. I've, I've heard so many different ways to pronounce that, so I'll slaughter either way, I'm sure. But let me ask you a question. How would you have voted on such a rare bird if, you, if these guys had not gotten a photo? Well, Michael Seymour, Jeff Sylvester, they're good birders, good reputation, right? Yeah, but this bird, this bird, closest it's gonna be is like Central Mexico. Um, first state record, right? Uh, pattern of vagrancy, a little bit, not a whole lot, but um, so without a photo, what would you do? So notice how much of a difference a photo can make, right? Um, really can secure a record in a very positive way. Uh, as they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. Here's a flammulated owl, all right? So this fellow, Bobby Horton, out on a uh, oil platform in the Gulf, takes this picture. Yeah, flammulated, flammulated owl on an oil platform in the Gulf. How cool is that, by the way? Um, if you saw this bird, you might not think twice about it. You might think, oh, look at the screech owl, which is entirely possible, right? Because you don't see screech owls out in the day a lot of times to, to really recognize what they look like with their plumage. But this turns out to be a flammulated owl. Big deal. So a picture is great. But a series of pictures, death kiss, this is so much better if you can get a series. Because at that point, we get to see the bird from different angles, and it can really secure that record. 
So here's a really good example of that from Willow Island in October 2007. You got a, a young male Western tanager here. But look for a second at the photo all the way to the left, to the left. If you just saw that photo, would you immediately say, that's a Western tanager? You know, I... <laughs> Uh, first thing that will pop in my head would probably be maybe a female orchard oriole. Uh, Bill's kind of bright, though. Not sure. Second one, photo, you, you see was a yellow wing bar. That's a that's a Western tanager thing, but you can't make out the bill, and a tanager has a tanager bill, so, I mean, that's kind of tough. Third photo, well, you see the bill, but the head is all funky. It's turned weird. You can't see the yellow wing bar anymore. Um, fourth photo, looking more and more like a, a Western tanager in that last photo on the right. It's definitely what that is. There's no argument, right? All right, now imagine this. Um, observer one submits the photo on the left. Observer two has the photo on the right, but never submits it. What's going to happen to that record? It's going to get ditched, right? Um, so this is why we need you to do your part if you have these records are these photos and you've never turned them in, we need you to do your part because yours may be the one that actually clinches it. Don't rely on someone else to do it. When you're submitting these records, um, we need helpful information, right? The least helpful response to what does it look like is it looks just like the picture of my field guide. Does it? Because I'm looking at this picture from Nat Geo Field Guide, which is pretty good. And I'm looking at these photos, and these birds, I see some, a lot of differences. Look at the bill color between the illustrations and the, the, uh, the photos. Uh, look at the wing bar on the birds on the left in the illustration versus the bird in the photo. Look at the tertials and, and how dark the tertials are. Um, the bright yellow rump, that's not noted in those illustrations the way those birds are posed. Look at the, the, the mantle color. It's quite different. All right. So... A person might write down in the least helpful way, tanager sized, okay, true. Body bright yellow, true. Reddish on head area, you can see a little red in like the lures and stuff around the, the bill, um, the, bird on the, the photo on the right, but head area, that is the whole head is just one part. Strong white wing bars did not note yellow from wing bar. Well, no BRC is ever gonna accept that description because it doesn't clinch a Western tanager of any shape or size, right? Now, getting warmer now. So tanager was yellow below, a yellow upper wing bar, white lower wing bar. Well, that's a Western tanager thing. Um, so you may have eliminated some other stuff, but did you really give enough evidence that it was definitely a Western tanager? Speaking of wing bars, and Donna has got this uh, graphic in here of, of bird topography. Please take the time to learn and apply basic bird topography when documenting and reporting. It helps so much because it's precise. Plus, you get to use cool words like axillaries and auriculars and things like that. Now, what does it really look like? Let's see why it's a tanager and not it's an oriole, right? Um, what about birds nearby you can compare it to, to rule out other species? Describe the bill. Tanager bill's pretty, pretty distinct, right? Uniform yellow below, because if it was yellow but pale in the center, it might be like a female uh, uh, Baltimore Oriole or Bullock's Oriole, something like that. Yellow upper wing bar or lower wing bar, we've talked about that. But what about the tertials? Look at those tertials in this, in this top photo. Look how jet black those are, how high contrast you there, right? Why not mention it? What about the upper part of coloration, the tail, anything odd or unusual, staining, molting, anything like that? What about behavior? Behavior, you know behavior is, what about, you see a bird on a barbed wire fence, brown little brown job bobbing its tail, the behavior alone and the location is probably gonna clue you in the Eastern Phoebe, right? You know this. So in these descriptions, you have to have that in there too. Is the bird diving? Is it fly catching? What is it doing? And then the details of the actual observation, not just the bird. What kind of tree? How high up? Was it feeding, resting, the habitat? The distance and duration? Was the view obscured? Was it too bright? Was it too dark? Tell us all that, right? And all those questions are in the long form for you to, to answer. 
So let's give you a little quizzy quiz, as I tell my students, right? So if you don't have paper nearby, grab a sheet real quick. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. I'm going to show you three videos. Video. I tested this out earlier, and it worked, so we're going to try this. And you're going to be, let's say, looking through a scope or your binoculars. Pretend you're doing that in the videos. And you're going to see three potential first state record birds here in these videos, back to back to back. The videos are uh, several seconds long, 30 to 45 seconds piece or so, giving you enough time to make some notes that maybe by the end of this presentation, if you haven't turned me off, <laughs> you can either guess what they are or I'll tell you, all right? So be ready. Here's the first one right here. All right, make some notes. You're looking through your scope. You're saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what is that? And I'd suggest even if you know what this one is, what would you note to prove that you know what you saw? Okay, that's it. Next one. Number two, right now. And this third one, listen very carefully for vocalization. Right there. All right, that was it. I'm gonna add before I read this slide, consider that practicing all these notes and turning in observations and getting better at uh, thorough observations or long forms can help you get ready for when a record like one of those actually comes to pass, right? So that's another reason why you should be turning in records if you're not. Okay, so let's say you have a bird that's not on the, on the review list it's not a first state record, but it still gets flagged by eBird. Well, rare is rare, right? Uh, whether it's LBRC or whether it's eBird. So we need to discuss this as well. Well, what does this mean? Well, remember rare is a relative term. They have many contexts. So you've got sometimes common birds are not common. And we said this earlier in the presentation, early and late migrants, right? Extra level dates, summering or wintering birds that don't normally summer or winter in an area that can happen. Scarlet Tanger here, two documented winter records for Louisiana. That's pretty crazy, right? Look at the range map. That bird is supposed to be in South America drinking margaritas or something like that, right? Um, and it's the Louisiana coast. This is happening more and more often, more and more often. If you're doing South Louisiana CBCs, you're all too aware of it. So this requires some real documentation. Sometimes you have common birds in an unusual location, like this uh, Hensel Sparrow here. I had one in my yard uh, the last fall. Pretty amazing. Uh, sometimes you have birds that have uncommon numbers, right? Unseasonably high numbers. So also needs to be documented. With eBird, you have eBird filters, of course. In each parish and in other states, each county, they all have their own eBird filters based on the available data, which may be scarce for some species in some parishes. So um, you get a gray kingbird somewhere, you expect to be flagged, right? But if you get an alder flycatcher somewhere, you think, what's well, a pretty common bird in May? Why well, am I getting flagged or at least flycatcher? Well, in some parishes, yours may be the first record or the first record for that month. So that's why you're getting flagged sometimes. Anyway, filter numbers are set based on seasonal changes, 
Sometimes we'll change them every few days, even under a week. Tripping the filter results in a flag that can happen for two reasons, either an unusual occurrence of a species or an unusual number of a species. The eBird filters generally confirm what we thought all along, which is that common birds are misidentified way more frequently than you could ever imagine. Common species often don't get a second look. That's a big mistake. Study these common guys. Because a species is common, the same cautions that you do for a rare species, you just throw those out the window sometimes because you know, it's common. Take another look, right? Um, so when challenged, observers are aghast that they're being questioned about the identification of such a common species. This happens all too often. Um, but they're in their eBird filter in the review. We, we pull up this, you know, every few days and there's this, no, this is not a red-shouldered hawk. No, this is not a song sparrow. Um, and most everybody's okay with that because everybody knows that we all make mistakes. We all do, every single one of us, and we always will. Um, but don't be upset when someone points it out because it's science. All right, having your good birds verified increases your reputation among your peers, right? Your reputation as a competent birder is going to go up along with the number of good birds that you find that are verified. And what do you do with these birds? Well, there's no evidentiary standard for bird records, meaning that it, there's no one process, there's no one, fit, one size fits all approach to documentation. Really, it depends on the more unusual, the more unprecedented the record, right? So if you look where these axes meet, earlier arrival by one to two days on average, that's really a big deal but it doesn't necessarily require as much documentation as say a first North American record, right? Which is a huge deal. And we've had a few of those in Louisiana. Um, early, again, these one to two earlier, this is based on years of data, decades. Um, but every year we get reports of these same birds. So this is what I call Louisiana's greatest hits of birds that were reported too early. And the one I'm gonna focus on is Mississippi kite. We see this happen every single year. Every single year I, I'm told, or other reviewers are told, really, we're, I guess we're all told, so-and-so has a Mississippi kite, well, I, but it's January. Yeah, but they swear they've got one. They have one all summer breeding there, and this one's there, it's in the same tree. They know it's the bird. Okay, they got a picture? Uh, no, but they know it's the bird. Okay, I need to see it there um, because if you look at eBird, you can go back to 1900, last time I looked, which was just a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, there's never been a single accepted record of Mississippi kite in Louisiana outside of season, ever, ever. Um, this is one, though, that gets reported all the time out of season. I once had a guy on a nearby lake. He's a nice guy. He's not a birder, but he's an outdoorsman. And he swore up and down that he had a Mississippi kite at night that was dive bombing uh, his fishing lures. He was night fishing uh, and because he lives on the lake and he had a, a boathouse with a light on it and he could night fish out there for white perch, what you call Sacco Lake, South Louisiana. So um, somebody like forces me to go. Like, all right, I'm gonna go, but it's on Mississippi Kite. Well, he's a nice guy and he said, okay, so I go. It's a bat, a bat. It's not even a bird. It's a mammal. <laughs> it's like six inches across, <laughs> not a Mississippi kite. I was beyond flustered. Um, so I'm not saying every Mississippi kite out of season is a bat, but if that can happen, anybody can mess that bird up, okay? So document that one to two day thing, that, that's a big deal, all right? No matter how good your reputation, it's gonna decline. <laughs> if you're less careful, right? The more you report common birds when they're not common birds, uh, when they're outside of season or they're early or things like that, and you have no documentation or if you fake documentation, that's happened too, the reputation drops precipitously. Don't do that. It's not worth that, right? Just be honest. And as I say at the bottom, documentation isn't about pride or reward or notoriety. It's about responsibility. It's about responsibility. And if you know birders who expect notoriety for their birding, you know a jerk birder. <laughs> Just gonna be honest. 
Um, my favorite slide here, and I commended Donna on having a uh, raising ears. Well, the whole thing is just knows who knows who. Then over here, you got favoritism. Well, I'm going to guarantee I've been here for 10, 10 years. And I'm not a South Louisiana. I'm not an LSU guy. I'm not a, you know, I have nothing to gain up here in Claiborne Parish by showing favoritism to anybody through the LBRC. I have nothing to gain by that whatsoever. Your reputation is a big deal. It can't, yeah, but evidence trumps it. If you don't have the evidence, I don't care who you are, you can miss out on a record. It can get shot down if there's not enough evidence or if the evidence you do have is just a little flawed or a little skewed or that photo is a little blurry. Sometimes it just doesn't go through. All right, get yourself a camera if you don't have one. This slide or the next slide are just some amazing records that we probably only went through because they were photographed. 1970 photograph of a yellow nose albatross. Try convincing somebody you had an albatross off the Louisiana coast, but you don't have a photo. Good luck. That, I mean, I would, I would not expect a single person to believe me if I said that. This cast and sparrow at the bottom right of this picture of this slide. I'll tell you about that. Terry Davis, who's a Shreveport birder, and he's got maybe the best ears in the state. Terry Davis got that bird driving 45 miles an hour down the highway with his window open in a five-lane highway in Bossier City. Heard it sing, and he turned around in the middle of traffic, went back and found it. Did he have a camera? No. <laughs> so he calls Charlie Lyon, Jeff Trahan. They come over, and they photograph the bird. Boom. There you go. So very cool. But he knew when he heard it, he knew what it was. But is it going to get accepted? No. So he does due diligence. He asks somebody with a camera. They come out and get the bird. No questions asked. We're good. Through the camera lens, you can learn a lot, right? This mentions P8 and P10 are, on, are sheathed. You couldn't see this on this hummingbird other, otherwise without that camera. And here you can see this. And you see this little white box? That's your metadata, the EXIF data. And this can prove that you took that photo when you say that you took it, right? Donna's big tip to you with a camera, get photos, then observe in advance, get more photos, then observe in advance, get more photos, get better photos, then keep doing it. Don't just rely on one photo. Get as many as you can, please. I told her I was so excited she had this slide in here. Do not let the camera turn in a sloppy observer. If you're with me, and especially if you're a newer, newer burger, you heard me say, put your binoculars down. I Because I'm pretty adamant about telling people that. You'll learn so much more by putting those binoculars down. And you will learn infinitely more by putting down the camera. Have it with you. Have it with you when you need it. But don't bird through a camera because that's not birding. I'm just going to be really opinionated. Sorry. But you'll learn so much more about it if you just observe. Uh, can't, uh, these things are extensions of the eye. They're not replacements. So when you need the binoculars, throw them up immediately. But when you don't, drop them and observe, and you'll learn a lot more about birds and birding. About reporting birding, why should I bother? Too busy, too lazy. What do I know? I'm not an expert. That happens a lot. Doesn't, expert or not, does your picture show a black-tailed godwit? If it does, submit the record. I put it on Facebook. Well, that's like, you know, just a black hole maybe. that Nothing may happen there. My record won't be accepted. Well, you don't know that until you submit the record. And then someone else will certainly do it. Let me tell you something. If you're with a bunch of other people and everybody sees this rare bird and you think, well, there's all these other great birders there, like these Uber birders, they'll report it. I'm telling you now, you are probably 95% wrong in making that guess. This is my biggest pet peeve as an LBRC member that I cannot believe how many people don't submit records when they had photos and they think somebody else is going to do it. Here's just one of dozens of examples I could give. It's a rough-legged hawk in Natchitoches Parish from 1999. Rough-legged hawk. We don't have a lot of those in Louisiana. <laughs> Lots of observers. There was a BRAS field trip to see it. <clears throat> photos taken. Only one report submitted without photos. Would you vote on this? So it makes it really difficult to keep up with the actual events of, of rare birds in the state unless you're submitting the records. So please submit them. Don't be afraid of the rejection. 
everybody, me, every, Steve, Donna, Conover, Eric Jones, Dan, everybody has got records rejected. Often many. <laughs> it happens. Why? Sometimes it's the reputation of the observer. But generally, most birders are pretty careful and they're very honest. But sometimes you have some who are careless or they stretch the truth a little bit, and they're known for that. Well, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Quality of description, though, is usually the problem. It's a lack of evidence. That's why it's rejected. The circumstance of the observation, again, you're driving down the highway at 70 miles an hour, and you saw a bird for five seconds. Huh. Yeah, it's tough. The difficulty of the observation. That sandpiper looks like a lot of other sandpipers. How do you know it was this one? And then the bylaws, again, require that a first state record has to have hard evidence because we have to get it right. We can't get it wrong, have egg on our face later. Everyone has had a record rejected. This record is by Donna and Steve, and it was rejected. They have them rejected just as frequently as other experts do. It happens, right? So instead of taking offense, acknowledge that your record has some problem, right? And try to correct that in the future. Um, there's no hard and fast rule about rejecting in the bylaws. That's an up to individual uh, uh, interpretation. And it says that in the bylaws. So for example, if there's this one photo of the bird that's a little fuzzy and that you're reporting a mew goal, but this one photo you have really suggests a ring bill. Well, one LBRC member may say, well, most everything's correct. About 95% of it's correct. Another member may say, well, more, it's more like 50% of it's correct because this one photo says a lot to me. And I see some serious doubt here. I'm not going to vote for that. So that can happen. And again, just one or two no votes, and it's out. Things about how to think in the, and how to understand uh, how to present yourself with these birds or, or, or think about these birds. Be doubtful. Be, be a skeptic while viewing any bird, even a fantastic bird that's reported, right? That stakeout McGillivray's warbler you may be looking at may actually be a common yellow throat. You just have it in your head that's McGillivray's warbler because people said there's one right there. It happens. Mass hysteria, power suggestion, it happens. We've all fallen for that, right? Be honest to yourself and others about the quality of and your confidence in your observation, right? Don't be discouraged if you make mistakes or when you make mistakes because everybody does. You always will. Don't be embarrassed to ask questions or report the observations. And learn your common birds. Rare birds are encountered rarely, right? Common birds, common. Uh, I read this advice by Ken Kaufman years ago, and he, he was talking about impudence, impid fly catchers. And he said to study impudence, uh, to be ready for a rare one, a rare one for your area, study the ones that are in your area. Know them. Or study them really, really well. And then when one that shows up, shows up and it's, it's odd, you know it immediately, right? All right. Finally... The video answers. Are you ready? Are you ready? So here you go. Here are the answers. These guys. All right. They're going to pop up, I think, at the end here. This one. Spotted red shank, a piratic flag catcher, which is on a lot of people's next 10, and social flag catcher, which is on a lot of people's uh, next 10 that's, that, that, that they're going to be in the state. So these are ones that uh, Donna sort of hinting at. You should maybe familiarize yourself with these birds, right? So that's it, folks. Um, that's all I've got. Now I'm going to stop the screen share here. So I can get back to the chat box and all that. I think that, that was great. <laughs> that was a great presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, let me see if I can. Um, please feel free to use your mic if you would like to as well. If anyone has questions, I'm trying to. Where did the chat go from my end? Okay, there it is. Um, and if you don't want to use your mic, I'm looking at the chat. I'm happy to read questions out loud. So your answers to the ones at the end, none of those have yet been documented, those three species in the state. As far as I know, those would all be first state records, yeah. Yeah. 
and it would be some good ones. I mean, there's no bad first hit record, <laughs> unless it's another type of caliber, I guess. But uh, I would be super excited to, to get one, yeah. And was Lemkin removed? Uh, actually, yes. Um, and super fast. I mean, uh, <laughs> that, that was just cool. Um, Lemkin was on my next state 10. Um, the last time we did a, a next state 10 list, I put it on mine and it's just in Tennessee and all these places and, uh, sure enough shows up, but then it shows up just and explodes. You know, I think it was on our list for three years and then came off. I think it was three years. It might've just been two. That's just yeah. phenomenal. I mean, that says a lot about that species, you know, um, and what it's doing. Um, we don't, there's no reason to think that bird's going to disappear anytime really soon, because of the apple smells, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I actually think I heard one today in the Davis Pond outflow area. Really? Wow. Yeah. Really cool. Mm -hmm. um, Do you see the question? Uh, we have one from Pedro that's asking, what inspired you to start birding? What is something you picked up during your younger days, undergrad or postgrad? And thank you for your time. Yeah, man, thank you. Um, I, I mentioned, uh, well, actually, Katie mentioned the, the little bio. Um, my mom bought me <laughs> the little uh, golden book field guide to uh, Birds of North America when I was uh, a kid. I was five years old. I had drawn a picture. She had done this needlepoint of like six or seven colorful birds on a barbed wire fence. And it, it's still framed in my parents' dining room. And I sat down at the table one time with some type of paper and some crayons. And I drew it, and for a five-year-old, it was pretty good. Um, so uh, she buys me this field guide, having no idea, of course, what happened. So I memorized most of the book by the time I'm like eight or nine, because I just obsessed over it. It's all categorized, and I, I, I really like, I learn by categorizing. I, I just, how my brain works. So um, everything just, just sat in there. And then one day when I was in my early 20s, I was living in Baton Rouge, and I was off hiking, at um, uh, Clark Creek Nature Area, right in, in Mississippi. And um, this yellow bird lands on the trail in front of us. And a couple of guys said, what is that? And I said, that's a hooded warbler. I've never seen a hooded warbler in my life. Wow. I, but I was at 20 something years old. I knew exactly what it was because it was all stuck in there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a couple of people, they said, well, my mom's a birder. And like, and I was like, well, what's a birder? You know, <laughs> I've heard that word. Mm -hmm. So then I realized there's all these birders around LSU and Baton Rouge and LSU is this big an ornithology place. Like I had no idea. So I find Lawbird and I start creeping on Lawbird. I'm like, oh, wow, we have this here and those here. You know, I knew the birds, but I didn't know where they all were. And I'm, so, okay. So start learning and you just kind of all that knowledge was up there and it Seem like a shame to waste it, I guess. So there you go. Great. That's great. That's great. That that's interesting you say about the golden book birds of North America, because I I just listened to I've been watching a lot of birding webinars since the pandemic and somebody else had uh, said that was their book and how what a great book it was. It's good. I still got my copy. Good for I, I, you. Forty years old and, and uh, still got my copy. You know, range maps. It's got sonograms in it. It's got yeah, I, you lots know, you of illustrations. Know, like these little things, but that's what they were saying. There were range maps in it and everything. So really? I didn't mean to in there, Katie. Oh, no, you're good. No, thank you. I, and I joined late. I was on another uh, webinar, but I did have a question about those last videos. You yeah. said something about the next 10. What, what does that mean, the next 10? Well, um... <laughs> People like to sort of guess what the next 10 first state records are going to be, right? And so a lot of people around the state make their list of their next 10 list, right? Um, so um, uh, uh, every now and then somebody, usually like uh, Paul Conover, Dave Muth, something like that, is going to get on Lawbird or, or something and say, hey, it's been a while since we've done a next 10 um, here's somebody's from last time. Here's a, here's a link to the uh, sort of a chart where you can see them all. If you want to submit your next 10, do it. We'll keep up with them and we'll see um, what happens, right? So, um, like I said, Lim Limkin was one of the ones that I picked. Um, there was another one too on there that I picked that I got right. So I've got 
I got two or three right so far. Um, but uh, it was very cool. So those birds have not been spotted yet. Right. These are these are these are dream birds. These are birds like we haven't had them in the state yet. But what are the next ten that we might get? Okay. And you're just taking you know taking guesses based on you know uh, that species uh, pattern of vagrancy and or maybe how much their range is uh, spreading over to the east or to the south or whatever. Yeah. So that's what I was gonna. It, I what piqued my interest was the mention of uh, red shanks. Mm -hmm. Because um, I really love shorebirds, and I got a shorebird when I was younger as a gift, and they talked about red shanks, and, but this book co covers shorebirds from all over, and I didn't know it, like, is red shank a bird that is uh, in North America? I got the impression it was, <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought, it's, that's why when you said red shank, I was like, whoa, wait, isn't that like in England or something? I, I don't know where they're at. That's a Eurasian species, I believe, it's not North American at all. Okay, um, yeah, but but it's one that does show a pattern of vagrancy. So oh, okay, okay, great. Some birds do, some birds don't, uh, and um, like I said, Mississippi kite just does not show a pattern of vagrancy. Um, but flycatchers, yeah, <laughs> um, shorebirds, yeah, you know, but um, some birds just don't. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, John, we just had another question come in, and I'll, I'll give it another couple minutes if anybody has a burning question sure. um, before I close it down since we're just now um, hitting 801. So, but John, the follow-up question from Pedro is, um, what is the next place on your bucket list? Where would you want to go birding in the future? That's a good question, man. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell them on myself. And if you have any respect for me at all, you're gonna lose it. Uh, I don't fly. <laughs> I, that's that's a categorical. I don't fly. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, so I'm kind of <laughs> limited. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've birded a lot of places in the states, and and. Um, I've never done Florida. I've never like done a big Florida thing. I've never done a West Coast thing. I'd love to do West Coast. Um, and I've never done, you know, the Saxon Bog kind of things of the, 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 the really cool Northern birds in winter. That'd be a fun one to do. Um, except, you know, I don't want to get hypothermia. So there's that. But uh, I don't know, man. I, I'm not a big chaser. I'm not a big chaser. I'm not a big lister. Uh, mm -hmm. I like to bird for conservation and, and, and for just the, you know, the, the integrity of Louisiana birding mm -hmm. is really what I like to do. Um, but, you know, every now and then a really cool bird shows up. If I have the time and, and I'm not too stressed from work, I'll chase it. Um, and if it's a bird in this area, if it's a good record, I need to do that for the LBRC. I, I need to, you know, as an LBRC member, uh, you're kind of obligated to chase a bird and, and submit a report if they're able to do it, you know. So um, a couple of years ago, I was in June, I was uh, working in my yard in the evening and Nancy Newfield, of course, the famous hummingbird expert in New Orleans, mm -hmm. calls me up and she says, uh, are you place, close to a place called Arcadia, Louisiana? I said, yeah, it's 15 minutes from here. She said, okay, I think there's a Mexican violet ear there. I was like, where? <laughs> so she said, well, this lady posted this, this picture online. She doesn't know what this hummingbird is. Somebody called me and it's just this picture of the tail in the back, but it looks really good for Mexican violet ear. So uh, I'm at this lady's house 20 minutes later from that phone call waiting and get a Mexican violet ear. So it was there for five or six days. Charlie came over and got pictures of it. And uh, so it was really cool. Um, so I, I will definitely chase if something around here, I need to document for North Louisiana for the LBRC, but uh, I don't always make it to the coast to chase a, a, a kitty wake or something like that. Sometimes I just have to let that go. That's okay. They'll be back. That was great. And I like birding for the sake of really understanding the species and conservation as well. So that's sort of what keeps me going. I think you learn more that way than just yeah. picking things off. I don't, I don't like it as a contest. So. Yeah. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. I'm there with you on that one. 
Um, but it is, it's fun to see these rarities and the presentation was certainly inspiring to me to be better about documenting those rarities and not assuming that others are going to do it because I definitely think that that's an easy assumption to make. I've been there. I know I've done that. I know a lot of people saw the bird and I assumed somebody else would submit the record. Uh, the recording is for the presentation. Terrence is going to be posted on the Baton Rouge Audubon Society YouTube channel. And I was able to start that Facebook live stream. So the recording for the very initial, very initial, like first slide, I think might not have gone live yet. But as soon as I close this down, it'll also load the recording automatically to the Baton Rouge Audubon Society's Facebook page. And then it'll take me a second to uh, upload the recording to the YouTube channel. So either later tonight or tomorrow, I'll get it up there. Um, John, thank you so much. A seven hour Zoom meeting sounds <laughs> horrendous. <laughs> so, thank you for doing that. Like I said in your introduction, just thank you so much for all of the volunteer work that you do for the birding community in the state. It's really wonderful. Thank you all very much. I enjoyed it. Okay, everybody, have a good night. This is the last of the Baton Rouge Audubon Society um, series just for this kind of spring semester. We will take a summer break so you won't see emails from me for a couple of months. And then we'll try to get these started back up in the fall. And honestly, I'm not sure if we'll keep doing them via Zoom or if we'll still, even if we meet in person, if we'll do recordings so those that can't join us in person still have uh, the ability to watch the recordings after the fact and we'll we'll update everybody for how we decide to proceed this coming fall. Thank you. How did your kids go, do John? How did they do on, on oh on the birdathon? Yes. We did all right we got 101. I meant to send that out there to everybody today but I didn't have time. Yeah. Uh, rain got us that afternoon for about an hour that was not at all predicted but you know, we, we could have hit about 108 or 110, but the rain stymied us for a while. But 101 is not bad. So we did pretty good. That's, That's, good good stuff. That's great. Yeah. That's thanks great. For, and thanks for the donation. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I'll be nailing the check now. Thank you very much. Cool. All right. Cool. Well, I'll send you an email about it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Katie, okay, thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you all so much. Looking forward okay. to watching the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.